thank you very much, Bhante, for also spilling the beans about my marital status. <laughs> um, it's such an honor to speak after two lively monks and uh, to Raushi Shilin. I, I want to say I've left my old mobile phone on his desk, so I don't want my uh, yin yang balance to be disturbed at this at the time of the presentation. Um, uh, that English English um, I want to make a clarification at the outset. I initially planned to present some reflections on the development and transformation of Vajrayana Buddhism by exploring ideas of apotheosis and deification, of uh, syncretization and assimilation of how Vajrayana developed through expansion of earlier Buddhist ideas and practices. But uh, given the 15 minute constraint, and also to avoid boring you with a a discursive academic presentation, I decided to change that. And today, I am going to talk to you about the strengths and the weaknesses of Himalayan Vajrayana traditions. I think in the last two days, we have heard a lot about the richness of the Vajrayana system, the high ideals. But it's one thing to sit on comfortable sofas and chairs in such a beautiful environment, being pampered by the hospitality of the organizers and talk about Vajrayana systems, and altogether a different issue to really practice in our own lives. I think we have to reflect deeply, do self-evaluation and assessment to see whether we are living up to the principles, whether we are implementing the high ideals. So I decided that this session will be uh, dedicated mainly to self-assessment of we who claim to be Vajrayanist. I'm not going to personally pass judgments and do the criticism myself. I thought it would be best to bring two major figures of Vajrayana Buddhism to pass their judgments. So by the token, I'm not going to contribute here any new research findings, but this is a presentation of bringing some old wisdom uh, to the foreground, of highlighting some wisdom. And the two masters I'm going to present are Mipham, who lived in the 19th century, and Drupa Kinle, who lived in the 16th century. Both of them are equally people who have reached uh, spiritual heights, great spiritual heights. Both are considered medical men. Both are also some kind of a maverick. Both are very learned scholars. And what is most interesting is both of them are very open-minded, critical thinkers who saw through the problems, the saw through the hypocrisy, corruption, and the self-aggrandizement of the Vajrayana institutions and individuals. To begin with, first is Mipham. Mipham, who lived in the 19th century, was one of the most polemic Vajrayana scholars. Uh, he composed nearly 32 volumes of works on so many kinds of subjects, almost all the sciences known to him. And among his writings, you find this very short piece of advice, a two-page long advice given to a friend. Now, Mipham's polymathia and prolific uh, nature is such that he also became the first Tibetan person to venture into writing about pornography. Now, I wouldn't be dealing with that today, but I would like to invite all of you to read through this short uh, advice by Mipham. And he begins by saying, through the activities of the Buddha and the skillful means of the sons of the Buddha, the four new and old denominations of the Buddha's teachings are formed. Victory to those who properly founded the means to the state of the Buddha. He's referring to the four traditions of Tibetan Buddhism, the Sakya tradition, the Kaju tradition, the Nyingma tradition, and the Geluk. I won't go into the details of their history, here Mipham says the Gedenpas, the Gelupas, are holders of the Sutra transmissions. The Nyingmapas are holders of the Mantra transmissions. The Sakyapas are holders of the transmission of exegesis. And the Kajupa are holders of transmission of meditation practice. 
So those of us who claim to be followers of these traditions may look inward and see if we do uphold these uh, different aspects of Buddhism. He says, the Sakyapas are masters of learning, Gedenpas masters of speech, Kajupas masters of realization, and Nyingmapa masters of spiritual power. How marvelous are the four lineages. The Nyingmapas are those with the view free from extremes, Kajupas are with persistent practice, Gedenpa are with wholesome conducts, Sakyapas are with virtuous practice of meditation and recitation. Although all has all the aspects, they emphasize their own particular practices. So Mipam is informing us that these are stereotypical presentations, but then they do have a focus and specialization in these areas. And he continues to tell us that the Gedenpas are like the body of the teachings, as they encompass all treatises and paths. The Sakyapas are like the eyes of the teachings because they, because they represent the union of sutra and mantra teachings. The Kajupas are like the heart of the teachings as they are single pointed on quintessential practice with faith and commitment. The Nyingmapa are like the life force of the teachings as they possess the profound purport of the Jude and Drupde teachings. I think it's generally self explanatory, but uh, some of the things that you may not follow, such as Drupde and Jude, they are classes of uh, tantras associated with the Nyingma tradition. So, if we basically summarize what Mipham has said so far about the achievements and the strengths of the four Tibetan Buddhist traditions uh, under the relevant hats, you have the Nyingmapas who are associated with secret tantra, secret mantra, sorry, and spiritual power. In fact, Mipham himself claimed that he could kill as many people as he liked with his black magical power, although there's no doubt that he wouldn't have done such a thing. And then the Nyingmapas being associated with Dzogchen also have the specialization in view, and for those reasons, you can see Nyingmapas being portrayed as the life force of the Buddhist teachings. The Sakyapas, on the other hand, are more associated with learning and exposition, and if you look at the biographies of the Sakyapa masters, including the five senior Sakya figures, um, it is mainly about scholarship and learning. So you find a great deal of scholarship in the Sakya tradition, plus a rigorous practice in chanting and meditation. The Kagyupas, as we all know, is a tradition of real practice of meditation. So you can see Kagyupas being associated with meditation largely. And then the Gelupas, if you look at their scholastic curriculum, if you look at the uh, practices they follow, it's primarily sutra. In fact, the Vajrayana practice in the Gelupa tradition or Vajrayana education in the Gerupa tradition is limited to two small colleges of Jyutu and Jume, and the vast majority of the monks don't ever go through Vajrayana education. So their focus is on the sutra and on speech in terms of debate, and they are uh, excellent in their worldly conducts. And for reasons of focus on the, the external forms of Buddhism, they are associated with the body. So this is Mipham's analysis of their strengths. Then Mipham goes on to make some amusing remarks about the four different traditions. The Nyingmapas do the chanting through their noses. The Sakyapas utter through their lips. The Gedenpa stress the guttural tone of the throat. The Kajupa squeeze their throats and chant. <laughs> I've been a Kaju monk and also a Nyingma monk. Uh, and a Geluk monk in between. I've not been a Sakya monk, so I wouldn't be able to demonstrate that, but I could do the demonstration for the other three, which, of course, I'll not do for now. <laughs> <laughs> then he continues to say, if I were to make a joke, the Nyingmapa accept the availability of the path of great perfection, through which one can achieve the state of Vajodhara without depending upon external agents such as consorts. Yet, at the same time, they claim that lamas, in order to have a long life, clear eyesight, and good health, and the captain, in order to accomplish the welfare of the Buddha's teachings and sentient beings, should have female consorts. They don't say that exposition and practice should be done for the propagation of Buddha's teachings. I think this, it is very surprising that having a consort serves the purpose of exposition and practice, and as the cause of clear eyesight and so forth. <laughs> so if you are enigmapas, do contemplate on that. 
then the Gedimpas accept the wisdom which realizes no self to be the antidote to all sufferings of the cycle of existence, yet at the same time they say that when a practitioner is about to realize no self, a trepidation due to the fear of annihilating the self as though he cannot remain in the seat will arise. In old days when the practitioner attained the path of seeing or was close to generating clear insight into no self before attaining the path of seeing, an extraordinary bliss is supposed to have arisen. I wonder if what happens nowadays is due to the evil times. Now this is in reference to the experience of no self. It's supposed to give you tremendous joy, but somehow the Gilupas see it as full of trepidation. Sakyapas accept the unsurpassable yoga, which instead of depending on external conduct, emphasizes the inner pristine wisdom. Yet at the same time, they practice the austerity of sticking to the meditation mat during recitation while on the path, as they will transgress the vow if they rise from it. If they have to stand up for unavoidable reasons, they are seen groping and crawling, merely keeping in contact with the mat. I wonder what awful thing would happen if they stood upright. <laughs> now, to some of you, maybe this is not very clear. There is a Sakya a practice manual which says you should practice diligently without separating yourself from the meditation mat. Now, what the Sakya practitioners end up doing is if they go to the toilet or do something else, they would stick the mat to their bottom and walk around. <laughs> The Kajupas accept the Mahamudra to be pristine awareness that wholly pervades samsara and nirvana. Yet, at the same time, they explain the etymology of mudra in Mahamudra to be a hand, as in hand and feet. What kind of a huge hand is that? I think it would be a great wonder if it could be seen, a hand that spreads over samsara and nirvana. So, basically, Mipon is implying that the Kajupas don't necessarily understand the real meaning of Mahamudra. Furthermore, most of the Nyingmapas are very wary about taking life, but they often assume women to be that which need not be abandoned. I take refuge in them if they qualify the Nakpa. In general, attachment is detrimental to the Nyingmapa tradition. Most of the Kajupas are indifferent to exegesis and epistemology, and they like remaining solitary and simple. I take refuge in those who have achieved Nirvana, simultaneously the realization. In general, ignorance is harmful to the Kajupa tradition. Most of the Gelukpas are aware of things such as alcohol and therefore have a good example of followers of the Buddha's teachings. However, most of them do not consider active involvement in taking life to be evil. Thus, hatred is harmful to the Gelukpa teachings. Most Sakyapas are complacent with whatever empowerment and teachings they have got and strongly cling to their particular Sakya and more traditions as the best. Sectarian prejudice and self-importance are harmful to Sakya teachings. So, Mipham identifies the main weaknesses of the four different traditions, attachment, self-conceit, ignorance, mm -hmm. and hatred. And there are many other um, anecdotes from different masters also to illustrate this, but uh, um, as there is no time, I'm going to go on with the second person, uh, Drupa Kinle, uh, one of the best critics of Tibetan institutional religion. Rupa Kinle has a song, among many other songs, about the four religious traditions. He said, I, the yogi, did not stay. I, the yogi, went. I, the yogi, went to a Kajupa center. Each person in a Kajupa center held a jar of alcohol. I, the yogi, restrained myself, fearing that I may end up being one of the drunk singers. <laughs> I, the yogi, went to Sakyapa center. The monks of Sakya disdain all other schools. I, the yogi, restrained myself, fearing that I'm being yoked to the act of discarding Dharma. I, the yogi, went to the Gadenpa center in the Gadenpa monastery. Even simple monks desire and hate. I, the yogi, restrain myself, fearing that I may become a disgrace of Dharma practitioners. I, the yogi, went to the Nyingma center. In the Nyingma monastery, they expect blessings from monks' dances. I, the yogi, restrain myself, fearing that I may turn into an acrobatic dancer. <laughs> so, 400 years before Mipham, Tupakinle had his own assessment of the four different traditions. And his, um, his diagnosis is that the Nyingmapa suffered from too much of ritualistic dance, of entertainment. And then the Sakyapas of sectarianism, Kajus of alcoholism, and the Gidempa of desire and hate. And these are due to some historical changes. For instance, the Gelukpas during Drupakinda's days were not politically established, and so they had more problems. <coughs> They had more problems with regard to uh, uh, their sort of own attitude to each other, whereas towards Mipam's time, they have become the political authority of Tibet, and with the Dop Dop culture and whatnot, you have a lot of violence in the Gilupa traditions. 
Now, the, in the final assessment, these lamas are not just criticizing the different traditions. They are giving recommendations based on their assessment. And the re recommendation that Mifam gives is really that the four traditions must coexist. That from the point of view of being Buddhist, we all share the same views and the practices. We are all students of the same Buddha and that we should have a very ecumenical approach to each other. And he goes on to say how in contrast to the non-Buddhists, the Buddhists are very few in number and therefore also uh, also should have this sense of solidarity. So the main message I want to uh, have you take home first is that um, Vajrayana traditions must have this sense of inclusivism and ecumenism. Even non-Buddhist traditions are considered as stepping stones on the path to enlightenment. Then the second, I think, which is much more relevant to this conference, is that, as we know, Vajrayana is one of the most expedient and progressive systems offering solutions to many issues in contemporary times, from environment and health and well-being to, uh, to uh, even economy. Um, I think one, we have to take lessons from the, the evaluation of... Is that a warning for me? Or? Okay, so, um, thank you. Uh, just uh, half a minute. So the lesson we draw from them is that we perhaps have to return to the original purpose. From a lot of the rituals that we do, do today, from the criticism that we saw of the Nyingmapas of abusing, uh, Kajipas abusing alcohol, Nyingmapas abusing women, I think we have strayed away from the original purpose and purpose of Vajrayana Buddhism, and that's where we need to return. And here is the final words from the Divine Madman. Thank you, Dr. Karmaji, Karmala, uh, for strength, strength and weaknesses of Badriyan Buddhism.